Hello, my name is Doris Kim. I am a fourth year resident at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, I will be discussing gastroparesis and if gastric electrical stimulation helps, so we will see. Uh, I do not have anything to disclose. I will be discussing the use of Intera, which is a device made by Medtronic. It was approved by the FDA as a humanitarian device. It was approved in 1996, um, used for medically refractive uh, gastroparesis. So, as you all know, gastroparesis is a chronic, debilitating condition. Uh, patients complain of nausea, emesis, poor PO intake, bloating, pain. In severe cases, patients have dehydration and malnutrition requiring hospitalizations. So by the time they come to our surgical clinic, they are miserable and desperate for help. So what do we know about the control of gastric emptying? Um, unfortunately, not a lot. Uh, we recognize there's a complex relationship between the neurohormonal and myoelectrical network that talk to each other. The star player in gastric, concentra uh, sorry, gastric contraction seems to be the interstitial cell of Cahill. It's been nicknamed the gastric pacemaker. Uh, so they're responsible for initiating the slow and constant depolarization that results in a propagation circumferentially around the stomach towards the pylorus. So it's thought that this contributes to gastric emptying. And post-mortem studies have shown that patients with demonstrated gastroparesis have a lower density of these cells. So it's thought that by um, giving these cells a jump start of sorts that we might be able to improve gastric emptying. When we talk about gastroparetics, we uh, typically put them into th one of three broad categories. So diabetics, uh, patients who have previous foregut surgery that may have resulted in a vagal nerve injury, and idiopathic, which is just everybody else. Uh, initially, patients are instructed to make some dietary changes, so having smaller, more frequent meals if they're uh, diabetic to address their glycemic control. And then there's also some medications that are, are available, anti-emetic uh, and prokinetic drugs. If those are not successful, then they can be considered for something more invasive. So temporary measures such as feeding tubes or TPN might be required. Um, pyloromyotomy or pyloroplasty can be considered. Um, endoscopically, we can insert some Botox to relax the pylorus as well. The most extreme is uh, a total gastrectomy, which is saved as a last resort for these patients. And I believe we have some other presenters talking about other surgical options. Uh, so in light of this, a gastric electrical stimulator can be an attractive option for patients. Um, we can consider this before resulting in a more radical surgery. So uh, gastric electrical stimulation is made up of two electrodes that are placed into the muscle layer of the stomach. And they're attached to a generator uh, and a battery pack, which is placed into a subcutaneous pocket. And this can be placed in either an open or a laparoscopic manner. So does it actually work? Kind of. So the research on this uh, is not that great. There haven't been any large uh, randomized control trials for this device. Instead, we have some small prospective and retrospective studies. I would say generally they show mixed to positive results. Um, just to highlight a few, ABLE in 2003 saw vomiting frequency to decrease during both a blinded and unblinded phase of their trial, so that was promising. Uh, Marani showed 50% of their patients had improved symptoms, but then six of these patients actually said they got worse. And then Velinovich, uh, their group showed 75% of their patients improved and 25% had no response. So these studies are all very difficult to compare. Uh, First, because they're all looking at different primary outcomes, but also you can see that they're generally lumping gastroparetics into one or two groups. And when the population of gastroparetics is heterogeneous, it's unlikely that everyone's going to respond the same way to the same therapy. So what I wanted to know was, does etiology matter? So at our institution, uh, we performed a retrospective chart review, uh, we placed 185 patients into three categories, uh, so gastroparetic, or sorry, diabetic, post-surgical, and idiopathic. And we looked at their clinical outcomes. 
So what did we find? Um, so a couple of the positive clinical outcomes that we looked at were weight gain and if the patients continued therapy. So you can see that the diabetic patients actually were most likely to gain weight, and this is in a three to six month period after implantation. And they're also most likely to continue therapy. So these are the patients that keep coming back and they want to get their batteries exchanged. Uh, they say they love it. Um, and then um, continue to reap the benefits that they seem to be getting. Markers of adverse clinical outcomes we looked at were if patients required supplemental nutrition, so if they needed two feeds or TPN, and, if, and or uh, if they had any weight loss. So um, diabetics actually showed a pretty high uh, use of supplemental nutrition, so that might be in part why they were most likely to gain weight. Um, but you can also see that the idiopathic patients um, had a high degree of weight loss. And then of note, post-surgical patients were least likely to require any supplemental nutrition or have weight loss. Um, in our population, we had an eventual explantation rate of 19.5%. And you can see that the idiopathic patients represented the large bulk of those patients that wanted to get this device removed. And they were most likely to cite persistent pain as a reason for doing so. And then you can also see that diabetic and idiopathic patients also um, cited persistent symptoms as a reason for wanting to get it out. So they felt like it wasn't helping them. Um, their symptoms were the same. And then again, you see that post-surgical patients were the least likely to ask for these out and the least likely to complain of these symptoms. So in summary, um, it does seem like ideology plays a role in the clinical outcomes that you see after placing this device. So diabetic patients had the highest likelihood of weight gain and the highest likelihood of continuing with the therapy. Post-surgical patients uh, were least likely to require any supplemental nutrition or have weight loss, and they, a large majority of these patients also continued therapy. Idiopathic patients had the poorest response to this stimulator with the highest likelihood of explantation and then also the highest likelihood of weight loss. So what I wanted to conclude with was a few points. So one size does not fit all. Etiology does matter. Keep in mind that this device is not a cure. It's for symptom management. Ultimately, the patient will tell you if they feel like they're reaping benefit from the device or not. So symptom improvement is something is a subjective matter that we weren't able to um, capture in this retrospective study. As physicians, as we get a better understanding of how this device works and how it affects patients differently, potentially based on their under eti underlying etiology, uh, we can do a better job of a um, offering it to the appropriate patient. So with that, I would like to take any questions.